Jeff Charlotte is a New York Times bestselling author, uh, and we're here to talk about his book, The Undertow, Scenes from a Slow Civil War. He's also written five other books. Uh, some of his material has been adapted for a Netflix documentary series. Uh, he is a contributing editor at Vanity Fair. He's also published in a variety of other notable periodicals, including New York Times Magazine, Harper's, Rolling Stone, The Nation, Esquire, and GQ. And he won a National Magazine Award for his presentation in GQ. In addition, he's a professor at Dartmouth, and not surprisingly, he teaches the art of writing. Jeff and his family and their animals live in Vermont. Now, Jeff is joined by John Spaulding, and John's going to be help, uh, helping with leading the discussion. But John brings his own expertise on this topic. John's the Director of Partnership and Communications at the Insight Meditation Society in Massachusetts. Prior to joining IMS in 2018, John spent uh, 27 years in publishing, most notably at HarperCollins. He's also a freelance writer, and he covers religious and spiritual information. He's appeared in a variety of publications, ranging from the Los Angeles Times to the Harvard Divinity Bulletin. He has an MA for, from Harvard Divinity School, and John is currently writing a book that explores the intersection of family and faith. So we're here to discuss a, part, a partial understanding, I think, of just how our political culture has gotten where it's where it is today. And, you know, some of us would feel that's gotten a little haywire and uh, we are searching for reasons why. And I think the next uh, 60 minutes might provide some uh, some good fodder for that analysis. So what I'm going to do is turn it over to John and uh, let the discussion begin. Thank you, gentlemen. Can everybody hear? It? Yep. Yes, you can. Well, thank you all for joining us. Um, thanks to Bookstock, and thank you, Jeff, for uh, uh, being willing to have me talk to you about this really amazing, wonderful book that you've written. Um, Jeff and I first met, I don't know, I guess maybe it was 22 years or so ago. Um, when I think we were both early in our careers writing about religion. Um, Jeff had probably around that time started Killing the Buddha, the online magazine with Peter Manso. And um, so we both covered mainstream religion and kind of religion in what might have been considered in its more, its more eccentric forms as well as the mainstream. Um, I stepped back from covering religion around 2010, but but Jeff plowed right on and, and has had uh, much success with it um, and done a real service. And you know, I think what I covered back then seems at times now, particularly after reading your book, it almost seems kind of quaint. Um, kind of quaint, uh, maybe parts of it were a little fringy and absurd. Um, and you know, in reading your book, you know, clearly the, the, the fringe has moved mainstream in, in many ways. Um, you know, as I was thinking about it in the 90s, I, I covered like Jerry Falwell's Institute of Biblical Studies, which was a six video cassette series that I, a, a course that I took, um, where I learned things like that there were dinosaurs on the Noah's Ark because, true. Uh, totally true. Because the earth was 6,000 years old and we can't deny that there are fossils, so there had to be Dinosaurs on the Ark. <laughs> um, you know, I attended a Promise Keepers meeting at Oakland Coliseum with tens of thousands of men uh, who were there to love Jesus. I visited Ted Haggard, as we talked yesterday, you had as well, at his New Life Church in Colorado Springs, which he called a spiritual NORAD, um, a global command center for spiritual warfare, uh, waged with prayer um, and no guns. Uh, 
And when I was there, there was no talk of guns. Um, of course, guns and God have a long and deep relationship with one another. Um, but not once while I was covering a religion story did I encounter a gun, see a gun. Um, certainly not at a church. Um, and, uh, but uh, as anyone who will read Jeff's book will see, it's really become uh, kind of a, a key piece of um, what's floating uh, or being dragged down in, along in the undertow. Um, so anyway, Jeff, I just thought to kind of get things. Oh, I, I see the light. <laughs> um, so maybe, Jeff, you could comment just a bit on what has happened in the religious landscape over the past 10, 15 years, particularly what the 10 years I believe that you spent with this book, and, and how has covering religion changed? Yeah, thanks, John. And, and uh, um, oh, I should say, uh, killing the Buddha, which is I think how we met, is not an anti-Buddhist thing. It comes from an old Buddhist idea. Just in the context, since we're talking about a lot of extreme religion today, yeah. like someone might be wondering, oh, what, what room did I accidentally walk into? Um, uh, and, uh, and back then, I think we were sort of thinking about um, uh, this, uh, this Buddhist idea of killing the Buddha as, as a kind of a journalistic method of, of asking questions when you think you've arrived at certainty. And, and we shared that fascination with the varieties of religious experience across the country. Uh, the first book I, I made out of that with the writer Peter Manso uh, uh, traveled around, you know, spent about a year traveling around the country, visiting some of those more unusual communities, just as, as you did. And, and for this book, The Undertow, I did the same thing. But I've also, I've always been interested in just sort of what people believe in, and, and how, and, and it, I often find it so lovely and full of imagination, even when I disagree. But having also written about right-wing movements and right-wing religion for 20 years, um, and seeing some of even, and I come from a left perspective, but even seeing some of my own, I don't think it's, this is that bad, it's moved so far right. And you mentioned Ted Haggard and his New Life Church and spiritual NORAD and spiritual warfare. And that may sound fringe to you. Ted was uh, the president of something called the National Association of Evangelicals, which is very powerful. Um, uh, New Life Church was a, a big mega church. And, um, but you're right. I mean, for all their extreme rhetoric, um, the closest thing I, I came to a weapon there was, that was at a time, if you remember, uh, 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 what is it, uh, John Eldridge, um, uh, what was that book he had? Best, huge best-selling book, basically about Christ wants men to reclaim their masculinity uh, and yeah. wants women to support them, and a great way for women to do this is at Christmas, on a birthday, is to gift their husband a broadsword, like Braveheart used, or Mel Gibson used, and Braveheart um, as a totally non-phallic symbol of their <laughs> <laughs> masculinity. And so Ted had a, a, lot, of, a lot of those uh, evangelical right leaders had these broadswords in, in, in the corner now. Traveling around the country for this book, trying to figure out the undertow that's been pulling us in this moment, I encountered more guns than I have in 20 years of reporting. And I've been on the wrong side of a gun in multiple countries. <laughs> um, and never, though, in a church. Um, the first militia church I saw which was a small me mega church with their Tuesday night was militia night. Uh, Wednesday night was women's night. Tuesday night was militia night. Um, uh, they also had swords. The pulpit was made of swords. Um, there were no crosses because they said um, now is a time of war and the cross is weak tea. Um, uh, I thought maybe this was fringe, but I kept driving and I kept encountering more and more of these churches with with guns, uh, a church in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, uh, Pastor Hank Kuhneman, um, Trump recently appeared on the show that he's a regular on, which is a full-on pro-Civil War show, no metaphors, they are ready for battle. Um, and uh, he says, uh, Psalm 23, you, maybe you, you know it, you've heard it, maybe in church or at a funeral, or um, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. He says, thy rod, thy rod is thy gun. Um, and that's why he had armed men in the church, uh, uh, one of whom was dispatched to uh, uh, take care of me. Um, 
I never encountered that in, in 20 years. I, can I read one paragraph? I think, and, and this is because it's good, this is actually an idea that I got from our, our mutual friend Peter Manso, really great writer. Um, too, and if you're interested in these subjects, read his book Vows, especially um, uh, the story of uh, a priest and nun and their son. He's the son. Um, uh, predicting violence the night Bob Dobbs came down, the decision that overturned Roe that we're on the year anniversary of now. Fox News pundit Monica Crowley described pro choice America as a death cult. The left calls the right a death cult too. But for all of its guns and punisher skulls and actual killers, fascism is actually worse than a death cult. It's an innocence cult. The belief that one might be as innocent of history, read, race, as a fetus is of the world, perfect and pink, read, white, unbloody in the Dobbsian imagination of the womb. The gun, too, is made clean by the cult of innocence, born again not as tool of aggression, but of defense, as the protection of purity, inscribed by a growing number of gun manufacturers with stars and stripes and biblical verses, advertised as a form of evangelism, a means of spreading God's goodness in the world, like a baby, the fetus and the gun, small marvel, Nobody's yet put them together on a flag. And um, uh, I think that's what's changed. <laughs> and uh, uh, that's what's changed. And, there's, um, and I think Trump ushered it in. He opened the door. Um, but uh, uh, there's just not been enough attention paid to the sort of the theological transformation that Trumpism was either riding the wave of or, or helped accelerate, to borrow another right-wing term, um, such that the even, even the right-wing evangelicalism that you and I both encountered, you know, decades ago, you know, looks, as you say, quaint and yeah. also unarmed, which was nice. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and in the passage you just read, uh, you, you used the F word, no. um, fascism. And, uh, and do you want to comment on it? I mean, that's... That's a, that's a big word and maybe unpacked. Yeah. Um, I, I, in an earlier book of mine called The Family, uh, back in 2008, which was about the uh, oldest and arguably, at that time, most influential Christian conservative organization, um, they, they run something called the National Prayer Breakfast, but they do quite a bit more um, uh, with Mike Pence as a member to give you sort of a sense of where they're coming from. And... Um, uh, they're old. They go back to 1935, after World War II, they actually got um, special dispensation to recruit former Nazi war criminals um, who were willing to switch out the Fuhrer um, uh, for God, right? If, 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 you would, if you just switch your allegiance. And so I wrote about that, and I wrote a chapter called The F Word, which was fascism. And I said then in 2008, I don't think full fascism is possible in America, partly for that reason. We'll never have the cult of personality that is so central to uh, what that term means. And when we, I do use it with, sort of very advisedly um, because of Christian fundamentalism. It's gonna, there's more than one kind of bad in the sun, but it's going to save us from that kind of bad because we're not going to give up Jesus. I was wrong. Um, and in this book, I write that I was wrong. Um, uh, Donald Trump, when he came down that golden escalator in 2015, brought with him the aesthetic of fascism, the cult of personality. The question was, would it be received? Um, uh, and over time, it has. Uh, I, so I used to be one of those people who said fascism is hyperbolic, because I used to think it was. I don't think George Bush was a fascist. I don't think so many of the folks that friends on the left called fascists were fascists. There's other kinds of bad. But this movement now, a cult of personality, and a key thing that I write about in the book is not just violence, which has always been, of course, a part of American life and American political life, um, uh, but explicit pleasure in violence. Um, it used to be, even, you know, man's got to do what a man's got to do. Ronald Reagan, you know, we, well, we just have no choice but to do this. At the Trump rallies, and I've been, been going to Trump rallies for far too long, which is a minute is far too long, but I've been doing it since 2015. There's all, they're ecstatic, they are joyful, they are very dark, 
And part of the pleasure is the anticipation of violence, what the press doesn't cover. To my astonishment, it doesn't cover the religion, which is always there. And it also doesn't cover, I think, because they dismiss it as just theater. But I think those of us who write about religion know that just theater is theater, and theater is powerful, and performance is powerful. You know, uh, the Catholic Church isn't just smells and bells, as some people say. There's, if it was, it would not be what it is in the world. Um, uh, but so Trump would speak for about 10, 20 minutes about um, decapitations, disembowelments, uh, prolonged descriptions of what could only be called rape fantasies, something horrible that was going to happen. He would say an innocent white, uh, or innocent blonde wife, blonde white, um, is sleeping and in through her window climbs a bad hombre, read, uh, not white. Um, her husband, a traveling salesman, is away, and I always got stuck on that traveling salesman. Like, what? Are there traveling salesmen still? And I, I just think I felt like Trump was really channeling the pornography of his like youth in the 1950s. It sounded very vintage to me. It sounded like something. Vacuum cleaner salesman. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and the crowd is cheering and ecstatic. Or when Trump talks about the executions he's going to carry out, um, dipping bullets in pigs' blood um, to shoot Muslims. Joyous. That's an, so we have the cult of personality. We have, of course, the demonized other. Um, we have the nationalism. We have, um, but most of all, the pleasure in violence. So what we have is a fascist movement. It's not a fascist regime. This isn't Nazi Germany. This is why I call it a slow civil war. It's why I wrote this book, because I have kids and I'm scared and I want us uh, to take the threat seriously so that it does not ever come fully into being. Mm. Yeah, and you talked about the aesthetic of fascism, and that's really about the spectacle. Yeah. It's about the show, right? Like you said, the theater, and, you know, a, a lot of media kind of get that wrong about it, right? I mean, it's sort of like, let's fact check these statements, you know, like, well, Leslie Stahl, right, yeah. with uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene, like, you know, liberals aren't pedophiles, like, and well, that's done. That's taken care of. And now, now the rice is going to say, oh, my mistake. I'm so sorry. I, I will back down. Thank you for the correction. Yeah. So, um, and the other thing that's, uh, that's interesting about the spectacle is, and you, you show this time and time again throughout the book, is that it's this joking, non-joking yeah. of, it's like introducing really vile, disturbing ideas that are like, oh, but it's just a joke. Like, don't, don't take that literally, you know? How, is, how does that whole dynamic play out between speaker, hearer, code, you know, like the part of yeah. what drives all of this? Oh, well, they, yeah. The Leslie Stahl thing, if you, if you didn't see 60 Minutes, uh, interviewed um, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene. Uh, I, you know how it says D or R, I should think for her it should say F, Georgia. Um, she, is a, she is a full fascist. Um, she's proudly Christian nationalist, calls herself that, um, loves violence, um, very pro-violence. Um, and 60 Minutes thought they could fact check it and they could just sort of interview her and quietly correct her. Um, and it was the, the best free media Marjorie Taylor Greene already ever got. This is a woman who three years ago, remember when elected, was dismissed as fringe and is now arguably at least one of the two most powerful uh, Republican members of the House, if not in practice, rather than name, more powerful than Kevin McCarthy. Um, uh, you can't fact check a myth. Um, this is a book of stories. I, I, I'm traveling around the country talking to people, but there, there is an argument implicit in it, which is that you can't fact check, fact check a myth. It doesn't work. Um, and I think it's very satisfying um, when an expert sort of squashes a false claim. And I think a lot of us imagine that we can sort of fact check our way out of this. Um, uh, but to do that is also not to understand the aesthetics of, of, of fascism. And it's why I think the F word is valuable. If we understand, first of all, fascism was always an aesthetic movement. It arose in partly out of Italian futurism, an avant-garde Italian artistic movement. Um, uh, but it's also this joking, non-joking. Buffoonery has always been an aspect of it. Buffoonery is how you make it to the center. In the book, I think uh, about 
people maybe know the QAnon shaman. This is a guy who on January 6th was wearing horns, um, said he was unarmed. He actually had a big spear. I don't know how you feel about being unarmed if you've got a spear poking through you, but he didn't, he didn't poke anybody. And what a fringe character, but there he was at the center of power. Well, they got him out, but who's still there? Josh Hawley, uh, the, con the senator from uh, uh, Missouri, sorry, um, gives his fist and support. Later he runs, if you've seen that video of him running, just, you know, his feet don't fail me now, um, as he runs away from them, but who has since come out as a completely pro-insurrectionist senator. So what is the fringe and what is the center? Um, Fact-checking a myth is based on the idea that we still hold the sort of the center authority. And I think about this, I write for Vanity Fair magazine and uh, there's uh, a, a piece in this book that originally part of it was there and talking to a woman I met in Broward County, Florida, Diane G, a QAnon follower, and she was telling me that horrible mass shooting in Las Vegas, 50 some killed, was actually an attempt on President Trump's life, who wasn't there. Um, <laughs> evidence was, and I kid you not, a man on the same floor as the shooter had been seen eating Turkish kebab. What more do you need? So it's not, I, I remember, so listening to my recording of our interview, I thought, oh, I can't use this. This is, this is too much, this is too weird. And I thought, I better Google it, I've learned now. Sure enough, there is that same theory uh, being proposed uh, on the Tucker Carlson show by a sitting congressman, former Brigadier General. Um, that's not the fringe. Tucker Carlson, I wrote that for Vanity Fair, Tucker Carlson at that time had a bigger audience than Vanity Fair, our books, every author here combined, right? We're the fringe. Mm. That's the mainstream. And I think we have to reckon with that before we can change it. Yeah. Yeah. What would you say is the role of January 6th in all of this? And, and a big thread throughout the book is that you're kind of chasing uh, the ghost of Ashley Babbitt, if you will, you know, who uh, went through the window and was shot in the, in the, at the Capitol. And um, what, what was that all about and what did that change and what did she become? How does all of that play into this story? I, I think January 6th, I mean, uh, probably like a lot of us, I, I, I had been for a while. You look at the sort of the evolution of language, like probably most of you are not surprised if I use the term white supremacist. Um, Ten years ago, no editor would have let me use that term. That's ridiculous. Don't be silly. Um, if you remember, between um, the 2020 election and January 6, uh, there were some people, I was one of them, who said this is essentially a slow motion coup attempt. Uh, and some colleagues in the press said, no, give me a break. That's, that can't happen here. Um, that's not controversial language anymore either because of what happened on January 6. So it is a pivot point in that sense. I was watching it and I, we saw almost real time this woman named Ashley Babbitt, 35 year old Air Force veteran, a white woman from Southern California, leading a charge down a hall. Um, a, another man breaks a window and she leaps up with her uh, American flag backpack, leaps up into the window and is going to go through. Um, you may have heard that she's unarmed because that's been repeated infinitely on, on Fox and by Trump. Uh, you can't see from here, but that's her knife on the cover. That's the evidence photo of the knife. Some people say, well, that's a utility knife, and I, to which I say, you know, try bringing that on an airplane and, <laughs> and, and explain to the TSA agents, just a utility knife. Um, and uh, a Capitol Police officer, Lieutenant Michael Byrd, uh, shot and killed her. Um, and we see only his hands on that, that first video. There's many videos. And then the hands of a black man. And I knew what would happen. January 6th, for, for, that was to me, I was like, aha, now this is, there's two things that are happening here. Um, Trumpism theologically is going to change. We're going to move into an age of martyrs. Trump had been trying to create martyrs for a while, talking about people killed by undocumented uh, uh, folks, um, but it never quite caught on. Now here we have a white woman killed by a black man. This is one of the oldest stories in America. This is the, not, not actually happening, but the imagination of it. This is the lynching story. This has been the innocent white womanhood threatened by a black man. If you've ever seen a movie called Birth of a Nation by D.W. Griffiths, 
the template for so much of Hollywood. The first movie screened in the White House in 1915. That's the story. A white woman is chased by a black man, she leaps to her death, and therefore the clan, the heroes of the movies, the clan must ride to uh, avenge her. Um, I, so within hours, it started happening. Um, both the martyrdom and the way that she was being made as a martyr, both as a white woman and aging her backwards. She was 35. No, they'd say, no, she was in her 20s. Soon they came to the age 16. Um, she was about 125, 130 pounds. No, she was 115. No, she was 110. She was just a little white girl. Um, but at the same time, emphasizing that she was a veteran, 14 years in the Air Force, which is another myth, the stabbed in the back myth, a veteran killed by law enforcement. This is the old fascist stab in the back myth. Um, so I ended up traveling around the country, watching that martyr myth form and realizing she's a central figure for the right, but not totally looming. But what she does is license a new age of martyrdom. So the January 6th prisoners, which most of the leading candidates, including Trump, have promised to pardon, um, uh, are martyrs. Um, uh, maybe you wear your MAGA cap at work and someone gives you the side eye. You too have been persecuted for your faith. You're, you're a martyr, a witness. But the greatest martyr of all, of course, is Donald Trump, Ashley Babbitt, just keeping the cross warm until he can push her aside and climb up there. <laughs> because I go to Trump rallies, I get all his emails. Maybe some of you do too. Um, I'd love to hear from you. Um, and after, right before every indictment arraignment, he always sends an email that says, friends, this may be the last time I speak to you. You know, it, and it, it always makes me think of, of, of A Tale of Two Cities, of Sidney Carton, nobody going to the guillotine. Or, you know, it's a noble thing I do. Um, but that martyrdom, or what the Germans call blood witnesses, uh, licenses a different level of violence. And I think, um, I think that's also like, a, that's a big religious change. Martyrdom just, persecution was, central when we're both on the beat, but I don't think it had fully yeah, no. gone to martyrdom. Right. Yeah. Would you talk, you mentioned Christian nationalism and we hear more and more about that. Uh, talk, just give us kind of an overview of what that is and how, what role that's playing in politics. Let me, let me bounce that back at you because we were talking yesterday and we agreed that we both had been uneasy about the term. Uh, and although maybe coming around, what, what made you uneasy? About the, the notion of Christian nationalism? Well, the, <laughs> what don't you like about theocracy, John? Um, uh, no, that, 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 the use of that particular term to describe whatever this is. Uh, well, I, I think the way that the right is using it actually, I, I think that it, it defines well and gives us a good sense for what, what their true beliefs are. I think it, it takes it out of ambiguity a bit. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know. I, what, what was. Well, and the, the ambiguity, I think that's what was both sort of Jewish to religion writing. Yeah. I didn't come to this as politics. In fact, I wanted nothing to do with the Christian right, which I imagined as just, you know, Jerry Falwell, a, a, a Southern man in a too tight suit, pounding his pulpit, thumping his Bible, right? It was only when I discovered, oh, this is a much more complicated. An interesting movement that I wanted yeah. to do it, and I was interested in the ambiguity and all the conflicts yeah. and so on. Well, I would say, I mean, I think when I started hearing it more and more, and hearing polit politicians use it as, in a positive sense, yeah. like this is a virtue. Yeah, it's like, oh wow, okay, now we're we're just we're just putting it right out there. Now now we know where they're coming from. If they're it's 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 they're clarifying their position, even if it's far more complex. Well, that's, that's the interesting thing, is, is, is American evangelicalism, which is the, the center of the Christian right, although I think we, there's some writers now sort of paying more and more attention to the Catholic right, which informs so much of the Supreme Court and so many intellectuals sort of shaping the movement, um, uh, has, has not always been interested in centralizing and simplifying. And now it is, right? It's embracing, right. It, it's... Let's get rid of ambiguity. Um, uh, let's, let's boil this down. Um, let's, in fact, and what, one thing I and some other religion writers have noticed is so much less of talk of Jesus in far-right oh, yeah. churches. Um, Jesus is, by definition, a kind of ambiguous figure, right? Um, 
uh, 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 you know, the Prince of Peace, who also says, I come not to bring peace but the sword. What? That's confusing. Um, let's just talk about God. Let's just talk about war. Um, let's just talk about the chosen one, whether it's Trump or Ron DeSantis or whatever. And um, Christian nationalism, I think, for the same, I, I, I resisted it after for a while with people using it because I was like, ah, I think that erases so much of the ambiguity. And now I think the current um, that this, this is why I mean by the, I think of this as the undertow is this current that's been sort of pulling us to this place for a while, um, is now strong enough to name as Christian nationalism, uh, which overlaps with fascism. It's not exactly the same thing. We have a Venn diagram of, of white supremacy, fascism, and Christian nationalism, and they meet in the happy middle that is today's Republican Party, mostly. When we spoke yesterday, I think it was Gnosticism. Oh, that, Gnosticism. The, it was Gnosticism yeah. was the thing that made me go, ooh, you know, kind of like... Well, because you said Gnosticism as, as, a, as a young person... Yeah, because I grew up... Leaving a Christian conservative yeah. background, Gnosticism for you was... It gave me, a, like, a pathways to an authentic... Like, for me, an authentic kind of spirituality of, you know, you don't need to go through the church and the pastor and... Uh, you know, you don't have to go to a fundamentalist church to get to God, you know, God within. It's, you know, this direct experience of God that, you know, and all of those gospels that were originally that, you know, described that, that have been kept out of the canon. And so now this, the, you know, this movement that is very traditional is embracing something that's non-canonical in some way, you know, this secret knowledge. The secret you know, knowledge, yeah. The, uh, the esoteric versus the exoteric. Yeah. So in the book, I sort of try, I, I show these, what I think of as these theological stages of this moment, which begins with the prosperity gospel in 2016. Trump is campaigning. We're going to win so much. We're going to be tired of winning. Mm -hmm. I remember a, uh, a preacher, a uh, black preacher opening in Youngstown. I think it was Youngstown, Ohio. No, different, different rally um, for a mostly white crowd. And he says, there's too much talk about race in America. I don't see black. I don't see white. I see only one color, green. Uh, <coughs> and that was what you were going to get. But then comes the pandemic. Then comes a million and more dead. Then comes so much loss and sorrow. Then comes QAnon moving more and more centrally into the heart of the Republican Party. By August 2020, Trump is openly speaking of QAnon conspiracy theories. And I was traveling around the country talking to QAnon devotees and I started to wonder if they understood this as a bastardized kind of Gnosticism, this ancient Christian heresy. If you know Elaine Pagel's great best-selling book, The Gnostic Gospels, you're saying, what, what does that have to do with the right? Um, it's an appropriation, it's a distortion um, um, of the idea that the God you see is not the real God, the church you see is not the real church, um, that there are um, the deep state is kind of a Gnostic idea, that there are secrets within secrets. If you've ever seen a t-shirt that say Trump's tweets, uh, Trump's tweets matter, and it's an insult to Black Lives Matter, it's the same thing. What it means is it represents the belief that every typo Trump ever seemed to make, he had problems with capitalization, all code. You just had to learn how to read it. And Trump has begun endorsing this and so on. That was this kind of Gnosticism that makes, allows for Christian nationalism in part. Besides the people I encounter in churches and militia churches and so on, most of the people I meet in this book don't go to church. Ashley Babbitt, who invaded the Capitol with a knife, stormed it, that was her intention, for God, she said. She wasn't a churchgoer. She was, in practice, queer, if not in name. She lived with her husband and her girlfriend. She um, was nobody's idea of, of you know, a, a Christian evangelical, um, but she understood herself as fighting for God, um, and because she knew the secret truths. You don't go to church. That's deep state, or as Gnosticism would call it, waterless canals. Mm. Um, uh, the truth is within you. Uh, Trump doesn't need to read books. He just knows. It's revealed to him by an inner light. Now, this all sounds like kooky and fringe and so on, and it's so tempting to say, well, that's just ridiculous. It, Except, <laughs> except the House, except what might be the presidency in 24. Yeah. You mentioned grief, and that's an undercurrent. That's part of the undertow. <clears throat> um, 
grief and loss and that a lot of what's arisen has come out of grief and loss and I felt like a lot of grief and loss reading the book you know and do you want to talk about that and maybe what that means for you personally yeah thanks um, uh, how are we doing in time Ooh. is yeah. it actually 106 <laughs> how did that happen <laughs> so uh, why don't I answer that and then we'll go to questions yeah well is it, is yeah. oh yeah sorry right we've got yeah. Sorry, I thought we were ending at one. That's what oh, we're no, doing no, plenty no, of time. No, we're, we're, My we're, apologies. Yes. Um, go ahead, answer the question. Sorry, Joe. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll go to the questions. I mean, this was something we were talking about yesterday and thinking about uh, um, grief and mourning. Um, uh, I think part of what my, if, if you're not of this persuasion, uh, of the Trump is persuasion, um, part of what can help you understand it, and I speak, I speak sometimes uh, uh, of what I describe and... I, I'm talking tomorrow at the Unitarian Church in Woodstock, and my talk is called Empathy for the Devil. Um, uh, and not sympathy for the devil. Not sympathy for the devil. Empathy for the devil. Empathy is not a virtue. Um, empathy is uh, politically agnostic. Uh, as a Jewish man with an autistic trans child, I need to have empathy for the devil because I need to know where the right guns are pointed. I need to understand what they're thinking, how it, how it makes sense. I need to understand how they came to this place. So when I write about Ashley Babbitt, there was a popular response, you may have felt it, of uh, so many celebrated her death. So many said, uh, I met one lovely man in uh, uh, Layton, Utah, the VFW, uh, pretty right-wing place except for him, Republican, but not the current kind. Um, and. Uh, and he was mournful for all the, the loss of his party and so on. But then he says, if I had been there January 6th, and he goes, <laughs> he would have shot them all. And I'm like, this, this is not the way. Yeah. Who was Ashley Babbitt? Before, uh, until Trump, her favorite president was Obama. All her life, she had struggled hard to be a good person, and she was. Um, but she had loans that added up. Uh, all the forces of American life had, had, had just kind of hit her. And she lacked the language with, with which to understand it. And there's a turning point when uh, a house, she lived in Southern California, a house, houseless man appeared to have defecated on her front lawn, and it's just compassion goes out like a, like a light. And here comes Trump saying, that frustration, that anger you feel, Stop swimming against it. Just lean back. Give yourself into it. That anger you feel, it's actually love. That's what patriotism is. And it's grief curdling into rage. I think grief that is unprocessed is incredibly dangerous. I think our failure as a nation to mourn the losses of the pandemic is incredibly dangerous. Like we would not be in this moment. Mourning is the process by which we understand that we have lost something. Something has been lost. Um, uh, sometimes something that should be lost. A lot of, a lot of Trumpers are, are, are angry because they lost white privilege. They, they, they needed to lo lose it, right? It, but it is a loss. Mourning was the process by which they could have said, hey, maybe, maybe I didn't need that. I didn't need that. Maybe I can actually embrace that and, and, and uh, the loss of that. that doesn't happen. So this book is in some ways my own act of mourning, my own fear for my child, my own way of reassuring my child, because look, I'm going to go, we can understand these folks, um, and I'm going to look for hope, but it's not going to be cheap grace. It's not going to be what some people call hopium, you know, it's all going to work out. Elect Biden and it'll all go away. Remember, people believe that could happen. Um, I find never Trumpers, uh, Republicans who are never Trumpers, actually more clear-eyed about this than a lot of liberals, partly because they've lost friends, family, they've lost so much, they understand that the loss was real. And we're not going to go back to the way it was before. So how do we go forward? How do we, how do we dream something different? We can't have that same thing. I thought, um, in, in what is a very dark and haunting look at what's happening out there, uh, there were moments of just, you know, that filled me with hope. And particularly, I think, like, at the end of the book, the, in the beginning with, like, Harry Belafonte, you know, where he, he talks about anger, right? He says that, he says at some point, it's not so much about 
knowing where anger comes from. It's the key is what you do with it. And then his life is an example of the anger that he had and how he used it so skillfully to make change, you know, versus climbing through a window, like storming the Capitol. You know? Yeah. Um, so I, that gave me a great, gave me a, a sense of hope for like, how are we going to navigate this future? Well, this book originally began as a songbook, actually. It was going to be Harry Belafonte. It ends with a guy named Lee Hayes. Uh, maybe this crowd knows, remembers the Weavers. Um, uh, uh, but you've heard uh, uh, If You Had a Hammer, um, and Kiss is Sweeter Than Wine, uh, and Good Night Irene, all songs brought into the popular American songbook, not, uh, not created by Lee, but brought in by Lee Hayes and his partner, uh, Pete Seeger. And I was fascinated by these guys who, uh, Harry Belfonte, who just lost at age 96, who have been smoothed down by time, right? Like I sang those songs in elementary school, you know. They understood, and Harry especially, uh, 96 years, um, angry every one of them. Uh, and joyous, too. He understood the struggle's not over. He looked at the civil rights movement, and he hated what he called the Hollywoodization of it. He was central to the civil rights movement. People don't understand that. Um, uh, he understood that the struggle is, is long, and that's the hope. The hope is not, how do we get through this by next week? The hope is that you endure, that you have these resources that maybe have been obscured in the past. Dale, the banana boat song, he understood as a freedom song. And, and, and he, he told me about the time he's, he brought down $50,000, $70,000 in cash um, to the activists in Mississippi right after the murder of three civil rights activists in Mississippi in 1964. And he, there's no way for him to wire the money, so he brought it down, lands on a little airplane, him and Sidney Poitier, and the Klan chase them. They're not going to try and kill them, but they make it to town. They dump the money on the table, and everybody starts singing Deo. The, you know, Daylight like, Come and We Want to Go Home, the Banana Boat song, which is a labor song. He worked on, he learned on the Jamaica docks. Come, Mr. Tallyman. Tallyman's the boss who you want to get out from under. Um, except they change and they say, freedom, freedom's going to come, right? That's the hope, but the struggle. The struggle is long. The freedom is not, oh, we re-elect Joe Biden, 24. <laughs> Took care of that. Um, uh, that's the hope I have in this book, which is a long, long struggle with good songs. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Should we do questions? Yeah. <clears throat> and, and before we go to questions, just to say, I think one of the things that's so wonderful about Jeff's book is that, you know, when you you hear what's going on and the, the stuff that's said in politics and the stuff that Trump says, and you think that's just crazy. And then, but what Jeff does by going out there and meeting people, church after church, uh, driving across country, and just seeing how those words land and the effect that it has on them, and then exploring the beliefs, like what sounds just nutty to us, it means a lot on their end, and so. Just really being able to see where that message falls, I think, helps under helped me understand a lot better what's happening in our country. So thank you. <laughs> um, okay. What do you say to the people that, that you interview? You hear these phrases in the hotline, Indiana. Okay. I'm just asking, what do you say to these people? I'm from Indiana and. A friend of mine said, when we talked about racism, well, she didn't think that slavery had existed. <laughs> I mean, there are times that you have to say in anger that this is wrong. I mean, you're a journalist, so I don't know if you get to say these things, but oh, what do. do you say? I don't know if I get to either, but I do. Um, uh, I, I mean, I do believe that the journalism has to change now. Um, it's time for transparent subjectivity rather than the myth of objectivity. Um, I uh, I think of uh, uh, I got in kind of a, a, a verbal scuffle with a, a, a senior New York Times political reporter who says we should not use the word fascism or racism. Those are naughty words. We shouldn't label people. We shouldn't assume. Uh, and, I, and I was thinking, actually, of a man who uh, root for here in Vermont. He used to be the head of the Vermont Klan. Um, uh, swastikas on his hands, Confederate flag. Um, 
never been south of Boston. Um, uh, uh, he says it stands for heritage. I'm like, who's heritage? Um, uh, uh, can I call this man a fascist? And you know, and I guess the answer is no, but I can say he has a swastika on his hand, but I don't know what he means by it. Um, uh, I do, I, I think part of the transparent subjectivity means when I'm going out and reporting, I speak pretty plainly to people, and I always have. I'm not there to fight them, um, but I'm also not there to lie to them. Um, and if they ask me, you know, if I believe something, I'm gonna say no. Um, I'll touch out, there's a, a guy in the book, Rob Brum, militia leader in Wisconsin, leads about a 6,000 strong uh, militia. And I met him, I was driving around Wisconsin after row, talking to people about that. And I saw in his window a flag that said Trudeau. And I thought that was odd in Wisconsin. Usually Biden, you see that all over. Uh, as my friend Jen here uh, pointed out, on exit one as you come into um, off 89 to go to Woodstock on the stop sign is let's go Brandon, which is means Joe Biden. Um, you see that all over. All these flags, by the way, are in Vermont too, all these right wing, far right flags. And um, he, uh, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm photographing the flag, not understanding that I've already violated two of their security perimeters that they clocked me. He comes out 45 on his hip. Um, and I explain I'm a photographer. He's a photographer too. He was, he was once an AP photographer. Um, and he says, do you want, I actually, I bought the flags too for just to support our Canadian friends. Do you want one? And that time I did say, oh, sure. Because when a man with a gun asks you, and, and I am trespassing, I'll say, you know, so stand your ground is totally applicable here. And then he says, do you want to come in? At which point I say, yes, yes, I do. Uh, because that's an invitation I don't want to turn down. We walk in, the pool table is covered with assault rifle stacks of ammo, body armor, real body armor, not the stuff like, you can shoot it with a, a, an AR and it'll stand up. Night vision goggles, all his militia gear, screening in the corner is looping his January 6th footage and running around is this cute little three-year-old uh, uh, child who has already been trained on an AR-15. Um, has to lie down shooting it. Um, and so we talked, we talked for about uh, two, three hours. Um, and I wanted to understand uh, uh, what, he believed um, and I didn't say Rob you are wrong and I will stop you but I did say I, I don't agree with you because that's an interesting conversation now this is not hey we can all we can agree to disagree Rob since the book came out just actually the other day texted me um, by the way please kill yourself um, thumbs down review from Rob um, uh, <laughs> um, but I didn't misquote him, you know, and he won't say that I did. Um, uh, I think that's how we do it. I don't recommend this for you, to be honest. Um, and where do you think we got all the different colors skin? When when she said she didn't think a slavery had ever existed. Oh, oh, I see. I, yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. When I say you can't fact check a myth, you can try with your friends. It's worth trying. And every now and then that we were talking yesterday about the sort of the Mobius strip of American politics, by which, you know, we, I was talking about Big Lebowski. Does anyone know that Coen Brothers movie? Um, Ashley Babbitt's favorite movie. She understood herself inv invading the Capitol as like Jeff Bridges character, the dude. It makes no sense. But it's sort of like a um, more like John Goodman's character. I think she's more like Don Goodman's character, but, um, but, but yeah, if someone has come to a really dark reading or a foolish understanding, it is always possible. Look and look again, and maybe your friend, you know, will one day uh, see the light. Uh, can you comment on what AI is going to do to, to all this? The, the, uh, it seems like undertow is maybe already uh, an understatement. It's going to be more like a vortex and... I've heard recently that, well, Harari said uh, that these uh, large language models could create religions from scratch, including holy books. Uh, they can also do conspiracy theories, probably. Do you think, are, I mean, are we doomed if it gets uh, 
if those things catch on? We, we do okay with conspiracy theories ourselves. I think we can give AI a run for the money in terms of thinking up crazy, untrue things. Um, uh, it, it's true. It, it's interesting because a name I encountered a lot as I'm talking to people, and this was the last travels I did for this book were in 2022 before Elon Musk had bought Twitter. Um, a lot of these far right people really love Elon Musk. I remember I met a very wealthy man, a billionaire, and I think he's a billionaire. Um, I didn't see his financial portfolio. Um, and uh, I just say that because I'm aware of fact checking. You know, I want to be accurate. Um, and Wisconsin, and his dream was that Elon Musk was going to find a way to put souls into robots. Um, and uh, and, that, and to that end, he and his brother had been investing heavily in Tesla so that they could get closer to Elon and, and, and witness to him and bring him around to God. Another man I met um, who, who was very concerned, he was dying of cancer. He was a full fascist school bus driver with um, uh, a gun flag. If, if you've seen these flags, sometimes it's just a big AR-15. There's an American flag where... Um, uh, the stripes are made of long guns and the stars are uh, handguns. Um, uh, but his, he, he, he feared for his children. He said, Elon Musk is going to colonize Mars. And, and when he talked about colonizing, he really, his dream was a sort of Old West in this return where men, on Mars, men will be men again, you know, um, and women will be women and there won't be anything else. Um, uh, and I do actually say that's important because the fury with which the rights assault on trans rights has risen, the absolute centrality of it to the project now, such that it was there when I finished this book in 2022, and now it is central. Um, uh, that's I see like AI can do things fast, so can so can we're doing it enough on our own. Um, I mean, what AI does to publishing. I don't know. I, I kind of envision a future like, all right, so AI can write a book. It's just a question. Maybe you'll go to Bookstock and I say, ah, uh, I don't think I want to see Charlotte. I heard uh, AI 39 is going to be talking over there, and I really like this book better. And some of you will say, I like book, book, but I'm like, AI 39 is cool. We'll have lunch afterwards. <laughs> all right, we've got time for one more question, I think. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming and speaking to all of us. Um, I just moved up here from Virginia, and I am petrified basically of everything you're saying like do you see anyone doing anything concrete to stand up to this because the thing that I'm worried about is you know you have how many of these psychopaths that have machine guns and it always seems like we have words and like I, I went and lived in North Carolina for a little bit in Charlotte and it was one of the scariest things to ever see we'd have convoys of truck caravans coming in being like we know you're the Democrats and we're here to kill you like if, if Hillary wins this election we're coming back to murder you all and it always seems like we stand up you know we, we have the logic we have the intellect we have the argument but they have the guns and I'm always thinking we're like a hair away from them just showing up being like well thank you for your argument but we're here to kill you and I and that's something I, I genuinely worry about and I don't really see anything concrete where we're trying to like rebuff them or de-escalate the situation where we say de-radicalize these folks and we just kind of sit back and kind of laugh at the radicalization but it's scary for a lot of people to see you know firsthand so yeah I, I think quickly the scary and then and then I think the good news um, first of all you should know that uh, um, uh, tricky choice Vermont is one of the best armed states in the Union um, and it's easier to buy a gun here than in Virginia and uh, per capita there are more of them um, so, you know, <laughs> uh, for you, I mean, maybe like if you want to buy a gun, if you want to buy a gun, I live in, I'm a Vermont, if I want to buy a gun, I find a neighbor with a gun and I buy the gun. Um, I, I mean, there are 400 million guns in civilian hands in the United States. Um, and, and I hear sometimes of lefties like, we've got to arm up too. And I'm like, no, the worst thing you can do actually is buy a gun. You become a target. Uh, I, I mean, I say this. I'm a gun owner. I, I like I just a, a little rifle I've had forever and never use. I don't know why. Um, and a lot of people have guns in Vermont for legitimate reasons. Um, but uh, um, yeah, I think, and that's all here too. By the way, there's a flag. If you've seen it, it's flying in Vermont. It's an American flag. It's all black. 
not with black with a blue stripe. That's the Blue Lives Matter flag, which, and if you're like, I support the police, you should know the guy who created that flag, I interviewed him, he said, this is an anti-Black Lives Matter flag. That's what it is. It's a fascist flag. It's pro-police brutality. This one's worse. It's all black, and it stands for no mercy, no quarter in the coming civil war. Take no prisoners. Kill them all, right? And that's flying in Vermont. Now, most of those people aren't going to do that, and that's scary. Um, uh, the good news, and I'm a very all-hands-on-deck person, it, like, a person over here says, well, I think we should be working on electing Biden. Good. person over here, maybe not this crowd, says, I go out with Antifa and I brawl on the streets. Good. I'm not going to, I used to argue against them, and I'm not. I don't know how we beat fascism. I don't think anybody, anybody tells you they do, is, is selling hopium. Um, we try everything. The Never Trumpers, the folks who won't use the F word, fascism, fine. If, if you're struggling, maybe you're doing, I see a lot of things going locally. I see good news. Uh, I, see the, I see the massive pushback in Vermont against uh, Vermont kicking out uh, 2,000 people, houseless people, kicking them out in, without housing. Everyone know this, that we, we had these people housed in motels, and it's reverse course because a lot of people got angry and got loud and got mad, and they did it with words, not with guns. And now those people have housing for another year. Gun for gun, we lose. Words for guns, making a vibrant democratic culture, because that's really the opposite of fascism. The opposite of fascism is not anti-fascism, that's just the means. The opposite of fascism is a vibrant democratic culture that we have yet to build. We don't have it. This is my, my I'll, I'll beat this drum, democracy is not something you preserve. That's a jam jar. Democracy is not something you have. It's something you do. And in as much as you are doing democracy, coming to this event, we're all talking. We're doing democracy. Going to hear a novelist, you're doing democracy. You're understanding lives. More, more, more. Every front, wherever you feel called, um, that's where your front line is. Mm.